Hey YouTube, how you doing? It's Auntie Mickey. It's been a minute. I've been recuperating from surgery and I thought I'd get back on here tonight and pick up where I thought. Who you calling a white girl? And the last chapter I read was chapter five. So of course, what comes after five? Six, okay. Pardon me, I'm still kind of loopy, but nevertheless, chapter six, boys to men. Although the change from elementary school to junior high school was a big step, I fit right in with the rest of the students, probably because the majority of us already knew each other and I had already established a relationship with them that carried over through the years. Of course, there were still the times in large groups that the little white girl that acted black became the brunt of jokes, especially from the black kids that were new to the group. They would soon learn through experience that I wasn't the one to mess with. I wasn't much of a badass, but you had to bring ass to get ass. Again, I relied on humor to get me through those times and those awkward incidents slowly diminished over time. I wasn't all that popular with the boys, but I had my secret crushes nevertheless. There were a couple of boys that broke the mold, so to speak, and showed interest in me. Like any other young girl, I felt a certain genuine acceptance on a more normal level when it came to boys. I didn't consider myself to be an ugly girl, not by a long shot. I even started playing around with wearing makeup and hopefully enhance, it would hopefully enhance what little ethnic features I possessed. However, I could recognize that girlfriends and boyfriends were a different story. And black boys just didn't hook up with white girls, not even black girls that look like white girls, most likely for fear of ridicule from their peers and sometimes even family. By ninth grade, I was completely at ease. The school year began pretty uneventful, giving me a pretty positive outlook on the year to come. I felt just a little bit more comfortable in my own skin, especially since I had made it a point to master the makeup game. To my surprise, even my baby sister wound up attending the same school as me. What were the odds of that? She was in the seventh grade and was considered to be one of the cutest black girls at the school. She carried herself so much more mature than girls her age, and I envied the ability she possessed to become accepted by the other black kids with virtually no visible effort on her part. Her older cousins also attended the school as well as the high school across the street. It was during my ninth grade year that I understood why we were kept apart. There were other human forces that didn't want her to believe that we were truly sisters. She was part of a different crowd than me and even had a boyfriend. There were times after school that her friends would try to push her into a confrontation with me saying things like, she ain't your sister, she fucking lying. Although it cut me like a knife, I understood that she was somewhat impressionable at that time. And for whatever reason, she also played along. When I told my grandpa about what was going on at school, he said to me, don't worry, baby. The truth will come out one day, one way or another. At the time, those words were of no comfort to me. Yet no matter how hard I tried, I could never shake his words from my conscience. It was obvious that her mind was preoccupied by other things besides school. I knew that her mother was sick and she sometimes had to miss school in order to take care of her. What an extremely huge burden for an extremely young child to tackle at that time. Then one day, while we were on the bus headed home, she sat in the back of the bus crying with her head on someone's shoulder, who I can't remember. I found out shortly thereafter that she had just received news that her mother died. 
and somehow all the hurt and anger I felt towards her vanished. That old feeling of protection seemed to overwhelm me as it did the day I met her. Circumstances, however, would not allow that to happen. Not yet. As the school year ended, I looked forward to starting a new life in a new school with new kids and a new environment. I asked my grandfather to place me in a school where none of my friends attended, and he didn't have a problem obliging me. By summer, all of the other kids were able to get summer jobs through the summer youth employment program, but I was never eligible due to grandpa's income. Instead, daddy somehow got me my first job <laughs> driving a pedicab in Pioneer Square. I would transport one or two passengers in the back of my pedicab from the center of Occidental to the King Dome for tips. And I felt like I was doing something. Even my relationship with my sister seemed to change for the better. I don't know what happened. But sometimes when she would pass my house on her way to her cousin's house, she would stop by and say hello. Although this wasn't quite where I wanted us to be, it was better than we were before. It wasn't long after that that she began to acknowledge me as her sister. It seems as though my body literally developed overnight. I certainly didn't look my age and it wasn't long before my attitude followed suit. My church life also began to mature, but not quite in the right way. I progressed from the junior choir to the chapel choir, which was made up of young adults ranging from early teens to early 20s. It was then that he caught my eye. His name was Alfred. Although I looked to the church as my escape from the jail cell called home, it began to serve an even greater purpose, an inappropriate purpose. Alfred sang in the chapel choir as well, and he was five years older than me. I had already become comfortable with older guys throwing action my way, but it, I never took the bait. Most of them were creepy anyway, but this one, he was so charming, unlike the rest of the young men in the hood. He crooned like Marvin Gaye and had the charisma of Billy D. He wasn't all that handsome, but his mannerisms made up for where looks might be lacking. I was sure that in his eyes, I was just a stupid little girl, but I was still smitten. I rested in the fact that my grandparents trusted that as long as I was in church and involved in church activities, nothing could possibly go wrong with what they envisioned for me if they only knew. <laughs> Although I was still a virgin and fear would normally never allow me to contemplate such a life-changing step, somehow his smile made my mind wander there. At first, he didn't pay me any mind. He already had a girlfriend his own age, but, he, but she looked like a mud duck. I knew he could do better than that. And deep down, I knew that he knew it too. Just a couple of years back, he moved there from Oakland, California, and he stayed with relatives living in Bellevue. In retrospect, I'm not proud of how hard I pursued him, but I intended to per persevere and eventually get this young man to take notice. As I further developed, so did the interest from other guys, but they couldn't hold a candle to, to Alfred. Even guys my own age began emerging from their traditional shell of racial bias, trying to slip me their phone numbers and whatnot, but my heart was set elsewhere. My infatuation with him wouldn't sway. We secretly flirted back and forth as I grew a little older and it was just that innocent flirting that seemed to fuel the fire. Even my grandparents were somehow fooled by his laid back attitude and wit whenever he and his cousin would drop me off at home after choir rehearsal. He's such a nice young man, mama would say. He came across to them as a big brother in their eyes, being careful to never give them any impression that our relationship was more than 
fellow choir members. By the time I started my sophomore year in high school, I developed somewhat of a shield of protection against the unknown. Here at this new school, I didn't know anyone and nobody knew me. I made several friends and found it extremely easy to go about the crowd unnoticed. I continued to see Alfred at choir rehearsals in church and our private discussions soon became even heavier. It was my grandfather's birthday and the choir was scheduled to sing at a sister church in Yakima that afternoon on a Sunday. I grew somewhat distance from my neighborhood friends, not because I didn't like them or them not liking me, but I just seemed to be in a different world than them. So I would usually walk to church by myself. As I neared the right turn to proceed down 19th Avenue, out of the corner of my eye was this little gray sunbird. It was Alfred. He stopped to pick me up, but instead of going on to church, we went to his cousin's place in South Seattle. I knew what was about to happen. We discussed it before and I was scared. As scared as I was, I was determined to be a big girl, to push back the memories of the last doctor visit. It's amazing how the act of sex, regardless of whether it meets one's expectations or not, can distort a 15 year old girl's definition of love. And I was certainly no exception. My head swam with an overwhelming sense of accomplishment. Somehow from all the songs of that time, like Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On, Glenn McRae's Hang On In There Baby, and Barry White's I Wanna Love You Just A Little Bit More, I thought I had a handle on what I should have felt, or at least the ambiance of the situation. It's true that the media can paint a picture with the wrong colors and hues. And I guess just like most unexperienced girls, my age, my expectations were somehow misconstrued. The fact of the matter was, however, that I had done the very deed my folks had been afraid of. I couldn't help but think, though, I've gone from boys to men. Playtime is over now. When I returned to school that Monday, somehow reality set in and so did the panic. My homeroom teacher, Mr. Barney, <laughs> was a soft-spoken man. And although I didn't know him very well, I always felt a sense of trust in him. I broke down right there in class when he took me out into the hallway, he asked me why I was crying, and I began to spill my guts to him. I told him about the loss of my virginity the previous day and, and asked, what if I get pregnant? He took me to the nurse's office and told me to stay there until he returned. When he came back, he took me to his car, and he drove me to the nearest Planned Parenthood office, which just happened to be within walking distance from my house. He comforted me as best he could, spoke to the nurse at the counter of the Planned Parenthood office and excused himself as he had to return back to school to teach for the rest of the day. I'll never forget the kindness this man showed me for as long as I live. After meeting with the doctor at Planned Parenthood, he prescribed something called the morning after pill. <laughs> and sent me on my way. I took it just as prescribed and went on as though nothing ever happened. My grandparents were never the wiser. When I returned to school, it was business as usual. As time went on and the discreet trysts with Alfred subsided, I even met a boy who seemed genuinely interested in me. He was really short and wore high platform shoes with black corduroy bell bottoms to, to hide his height. We started an innocent relationship that never went any further than kissing behind the portals. He didn't even try to hide displays of affection like the boys from junior high. When we, when we walked together on the school grounds, we held hands. When we walked together to ride the bus to downtown, he put his arm around me. 
I wasn't used to this kind of attention from any other boy. And of course, it wasn't long before my thoughts of anyone else became a distant memory. We only lasted a few months though. He got back together with his old girlfriend and even later on moved in with some older chick that just happened to live down the block from me. It was at this time that he, at everyone else's amazement, came out of the closet and announced to the world that he was bisexual. Imagine that. Rather than feel an ounce of shame, I indulged myself in the performing arts at school. I spent more time in my drama teacher's class than any other class that I should have been attending. Mr. Hodge, one of the few black teachers at my school, was my drama teacher. And his curriculum allowed me to display my talents and shine in areas I had once only dreamed of. We had stage plays, talent shows, and a dance troupe. Then there was Sam. Sam sang in church just like I did, and during one of our talent shows, we sang a song together. Sam hung out with the bad boys at school. We hooked up and I soon found out that he had kind of cracked in his head. As the school year drew to an end, so did my interest in any more guys at my school. They were either disturbed in the head or confused about their sexual orientation. And that was it. That's chapter six. Next would be chapter seven, an unexpected surprise. <sighs> Hope you enjoyed it. I know I stammered a few words here and there. Charge it to my head, not my heart. I'm still recovering, so. I will see you again soon, and you have a wonderful evening. Peace.